Thank you, Andrea, for inviting me to share my story with you today uh, and to speak about my journey as a fiber artist. My journey is really a confluence of several influences, uh, being in Maine, uh, Hawaii, where I grew up, the Philippines, and Nantucket. All these places have different cultures. And what I'm specifically referring to as a great influence on me was the traditions of all these cultures. And the blending of all these cultures has resulted in what I call today my modern interpretations. Because not all of these are traditional baskets, just, just a little bit of tweaking here and there. As I know you, you have, there are basket makers here and you do a lot of that too. So this probably is. The woven pieces amongst these cultures um, were essentially utilitarian in the beginning. Uh, for example, in Maine, they used to make potato baskets and they were used in the fields by the workers to gather the potatoes or for storage. Or even uh, in the backwoods, there were pack baskets. Uh, in Hawaii, uh, actually the Polynesians brought the lauhala palm to Hawaii uh, when they traveled over the Pacific. They actually used the lauhala palm as the material to weave into sails. They used that on their catamarans. And through the years, uh, lauhala is available in Hawaii. And the, the palms are used to make basketry, uh, make beds, mats. Uh, in the Philippines, as I, uh, they, you know, their, their works were basically Utilitarian too for use um, to make mats uh, and actually to make those walls uh, just as Jose Reyes did in his shop. Uh, and in Nantucket, of course, you know, you have your wonderful baskets originally used for storage or carrying vegetables or whatever. Uh, and and uh, let me go back to the Philippines. Um, Jose Reyes is from the Philippines or was from the Philippines and I am a Filipina. My parents immigrated to Hawaii from the Philippines. And about 11 years ago, I think it was my first visit to the museum, I, you know, I took classes, but I didn't realize that I had a connection until I came here and I saw the wall coverings. I saw the hats that you had. I think you've changed the exhibit a little bit, but I saw some figures that look so familiar, things that I had seen in my home in Hawaii. Baskets, as you know, were made on the light ships. They were made out of wood splints. And through the years, you know, the, the whaling ships, or maybe even during the China trade. Um, my husband did some research on one of his relatives who was a sea Providence, Rhode Island. And he actually went through the log of what was itemized on that ship when it, when it came back. And one of the items was bamboo, comma, dunnage. And that's a naval term for, it, it, it was like the, um, uh, the bubble wrap we use today. It was used to uh, wrap the, the fine china uh, from uh, overseas. In addition to being functional, these pieces can also be decorative, as uh, often what I call my home accent pieces. 
I've done, you know, we all do, many of us have done the, um, the nest of baskets. And some of you, extraordinary nests of nine or 10 baskets. Uh, but individually, they can be used uh, to store items again. Uh, I was at Kathleen's house this morning and she was using a basket for uh, throwing in yarn, you know, those things. Uh, I've done picnic baskets and oftentimes my clients use that to store their magazines or newspapers, you know, wonderful accent pieces, both uh, useful and decorative. And uh, I also, in my uh, accents collection, have, have, have done a, uh, a bar, what I call a bar table. It's a rectangular tray on a custom-made table. And decorative, and also the tray is very useful. It's a bar table, or you can use that tray, you know, as you're serving cheese and crackers or whatever. And I'm sure you've all use your baskets in different ways. The iconic Nantucket lightship basket is often a fashion, makes a fashion statement. I especially enjoy the challenge of creating uh, more difficult shapes. An example would be my, my rectangle. And I've created the handle my own version. Um, many other basket makers have their handles. Uh, and what I've done is, although it's traditionally crafted, to be able to make sure that all my staves, the weavers, you know, basket makers look at baskets upside down. As you're weaving and you come to the corner, sometimes the weavers don't line up. So what I've done is I've incorporated other weaving styles. Uh, what you call turnbacks. You, you really need to manipulate the weavers and be able to go back and forth until all your rows are even. So, you know, once again, it's a blending of different methods and yet it's very traditional with a carving on it. Another shape I find challenging and fun to do, you know, the kidney. Not every stave, as you know, is the same. If you look at it, once again, we look at things upside down. Every stave is hand sanded. I don't use machine tools. So I enjoy it and it's a challenge and the result is a wonderful kidney basket with once again, a traditional carving, but I've done, you know, I put on different closures just for ease of access. And through the years, I, I've done these uh, shoulder bags. And what I really wanted was something hands-free. And I originally created these uh, crossbodies. Originally, they were shoulder bags. But I wanted something that was a true crossbody that would just go over you. And so you're at a cocktail party or whatever. Your basic essentials, what do you call it? Charge card, glasses, lipstick, house keys, ready to go. And the telephone, of course, because <laughs> that's why I created them. They were made for the telephone. And through the years, what I've done is telephones got bigger. So I had to change the dimension of my, my crossbodies. So this is what we have today. And here's another example of a crossbody in a different shape, is the uh, fish and creel style. I, you know, sometimes we can't make all of our materials, and sometimes we can't find it. I'm, I'm sure we all go to Dell's for our materials. But I wanted a true crossbody, so I found an equestrian source who actually made these for me, for my specifications. So this is a true crossbody, which is fun to wear, and um, as you know, hands-free. A 
However, before making baskets, as you can see, I used to weave on a loom about 40 years ago. And I really enjoyed it. You know, it, it's, it was so relaxing. When you weave, you have something around you. When you're on a loom, it's the action of throwing the shuttle through the shaft, beating the beam, and when you do rugs, it's a great stress reliever. You can really beat at it. <laughs> but as in we any weaving, you need to be sure your tension is just right and consistent. And my feet, stepping into different treadles to create different designs. So basically, these are all, I, I designed this years ago. I actually, for this talk, I brought it out of storage. I hadn't seen it in years, and I'm thinking, gee, I did this. Um, it's kind of fun. And it's using different colors to create different uh, patterns. And I actually had it on the floor <laughs> and actually used my rugs. So this is, this is me 40 years ago. But, you know, I, I wanted to do something that was more portable. So I took a class in Nantucket basket making. And, and this was in Providence, Rhode Island at the Handicraft Club. And all, many of you know about the 800, 1800 house. The 1800 house was basically built a lot of the people from Nantucket came to Providence to look at the Handicraft Club. And matter of fact, so that was the inspiration for the 1800. In the first few years, a lot of the uh, teachers were from the club. They would come and spend the summers here. I just looked at the uh, class list the other day, and I see one teacher still from the Handicraft Club teaching in the summer. But of course, they've really expanded their offerings. So, uh, so you can see that the traditions from weaving on a loom and the techniques have really affected my work in the different patterns. And I, as a fiber artist, you know, I look forward to uh, innovating and creating. And, and I'm very mindful of the traditions, whether they be of Maine, Hawaii, or Nantucket. Many of my pieces uh, demonstrate this innovation and tradition. And as I've shown you, my, the crossbody, for example. Many of you have used this mold, the elliptical Mar Martha Lawrence mold, probably but I've changed it by expanding it. And about 15 years ago, I created my own cover for it so that it's a closed basket. And it's traditionally crafted with some changes, such as the closure, the longer strap rather than the handle. And yet, true to the style of Nantucket basket making, it's all constructed the way you would make your basket. And of course, a very traditional Nancy Chase carving. And the same goes for this uh, flat back. I, I also created the cover for this. Um, and I find that um, a lot of my clients really in, enjoy the, the ease of getting into the handbag. Another uh, form of innovation is this pack. There's a story to this. Uh, I have a very good friend who used to work at Jackson Lab uh, on Mount Desert Island. And in the 70s, uh, he had a really good friend called Mickey Fahey, uh, and, uh, a Passamaquoddy Indian. And he used to love to share his traditions with his friends and he used to take them packing in the backwoods. And this is very traditional shape. Matter of fact, about three years ago, I, I finally dared to ask Charlie if I could borrow his mold. And it was a very crude mold, like pieces of lumber put together. Uh, but it had this wonderful shape. 
And it was based on a true backpack mold that Mickey Fahey had done. And actually, I Googled him and I found an article about him in National Geographic talking about teaching uh, canoeing techniques. And so I, I was really honored that he allowed me to borrow his mold. Uh, and yet, I, what I did is I used the Nantucket style of basket making, created my own base, you know, and shaped everything and uh, my own rims. But I was also very mindful of the proportions. So I used larger weavers and incorporated this spiral. Uh, the spiral is actually the twill on a loom. Like there may be some spirals in here where I change the shafts or change the thread it's like you're doing one, steps one, two, three, four. And the twill is also what originally was used in your blue jeans because it's very sturdy. So I incorporated that in this very traditionally shaped Passamaquoddy basket. I've been thinking about this basket for the past three years. So I finally figured out how to create a basket that's three in one. Um, you may have seen the shape that I've done before. What I did is, I want to be sure it could be a clutch so you can hold in your hand. And I had found these traps, which you just attach onto it and becomes a shoulder strap. And Finally, I, I do a lot of window shopping in New York City. <laughs> it's called visual retailing. I finally found, because I'd been looking for something like this, this is a guitar strap. Uh, it's reversible on two sides, expandable. I had to figure out a way to put the basket together so I could attach my strap and actually create a hipster. So this is my new innovation for this year. This has taken me about three years to figure out. So, so this is my hipster and I love it. It's also hands-free, very stylish. And also you can expand it and it becomes a shoulder bag. So, so this is my story. Uh, through the years, I've, I've really enjoyed creating and innovating. But in summary, you know, as a fiber artist, we're all basket makers. We're, we're fiber artists. And I look forward to continuing to innovate and create. And I'm always mindful of the different traditions that are expressed in my work. And I know we all strive to create that one piece, that one collector's item which would be a true museum quality piece. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Can I ask about the mold that you use for the large basket? Right. It's clearly not a regular mold because it is narrower at the top. Right. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Uh, it's a puzzle mold. Uh, you know, you, on this fishing creel, some of you have done this fishing creel, it's a puzzle mold because the bottom is larger. Uh, so the center, all the forms, the sides fit in, and the center, there was an opening. And you, when you're done with the basket, you hope everything comes apart. Um, you know, you pull out the center, and then the sides all collapse. So. Matter of fact, this summer, my husband came back from Germany um, and the car was just packed with my, I, I do a show at Northeast Harbor and packed with all my show stuff, you know. There was no room for his clothes because he, he had to, he had a suitcase, he was coming back home, um, but also change of clothes for being up in Maine, you don't know, it's gonna be cold or whatever. So I didn't have place in the car for his stuff. I put all his clothes for three weeks in this pack. So it can be a wonderful accent piece. 
um, or functional. Any other questions? Can you talk about how, what took you to Maine and what brought you to Nantucket? Uh, Maine. Yeah. I don't think I had a choice because uh, my, my children and I are the sixth generation who go up to a farm up in Maine. And it's a beautiful spot. It's about 500 acres on the water. And my husband's grandfather was one of five children. So all the children had children. So it, it's really fun for our grandkids to just run around in the farm. They live in the city, so it's good to be able to run around. Um, you know, the sandbar comes and goes. You learn about the tides. There's a lot of sailing there. Um, and actually, I think it was a test to bring me up there the first time. Uh, we, because uh, if you don't like it there, I'm sure, I'm sure I wouldn't have lasted. <laughs> so, so I had heard, I was given an engagement gift of a, um, it was a basket like this. And it was a waste paper basket. Uh, woven by a Pasek McQuaddy uh, lady. And I, I found her checks that I wrote. Her name was Mrs. Livingston. I'm, you know, her name doesn't come up at the Abbey Museum, but her work was, you know, I collected a lot of her work. Um, I heard about this basket lady. And when somebody knocked on my door, and she had an old car, children were sleeping in the back seat. But when she opened up her trunk, it was just incredible. It was all of her baskets that she had woven. So I had the opportunity to sort of pick and choose. And I didn't realize I was uh, putting together quite a collection because she didn't show up after a while. And the only place you could find the baskets were at the Abbey Museum. Uh, so I, I, that was the first form of basket making I, I loved. And then I found the form of Nantucket basket making. They're totally different. Um, this was done freehand, but a lot of the uh, basket makers today, like Jeremy Frey, uh, I saw these big baskets you have up front. They're all using molds and creating uh, different baskets, new, new traditions, different styles, and yet staying true to their, their way of making baskets. So that's Maine, and of course, I, I took a lesson at the uh, handicraft club and I came down here for a visit and I came to the museum and um, my eyes just, it was incredible to see all the basket making going on here. How did you start weaving rugs in the, in the first place? Uh, we had a neighbor when we were first married whose mother used to be a weaver and she wove and she had this beautiful, she was in a enclosed porch and this huge loom was there and I just saw what she did. I, um, I did yardage. I've done a coverlet, you know, very traditional coverlet. But I just found the rhythm of making rugs, maybe it was a stress reliever, I don't know, with you know little kids and my day off, my one day off that I could uh, spend re weaving. But I really enjoyed creating. I was inspired by the, actually the oriental rugs that you would have, so the colors you can see. But those are totally different techniques. Uh, but uh, I always make things that I like, would like to keep for myself. And I'm, I'm very lucky that I have clients who like to have that, too. <laughs> so. Did you sell your rugs? No. I couldn't sell them. I, I just couldn't part from them. Yes? Do you have a website where people can order from you? You know, I think the internet is great. Uh, I, I think from this price point and the workmanship, I think it, it speaks for itself when you see it in person. So I use the internet as a way to have a conversation with people. I don't post as often as I should. <laughs> yes? Can you tell me about the black cane that you use for your Is that something 
that you use almost exclusively now? Or? I seem to, no, I, I do. It's funny, I, I just, uh, I just had a commission the other day and somebody wanted, it's that girl in the blue dress postcard. She just wanted a very traditional, she didn't even want a spiral. She wanted it in uh, cane and cherry wood. Uh, but I, well, look at me. Uh, just as I explained everything. I, I, I think black is, you know, it goes with everything. We're having this conversation. You know, when you travel a lot, you keep it in the black, or it, it's complicated when you have blue shoes and whatever. But I was telling Andrea that uh, blue and black are very European. They're, it's very chic. So, but I, I love weaving. The only thing about when I weave with black is my fingernails, my hands are all black. Mm. Um, is it harder to see what you're doing with the black? Yes. Yes, and, and uh, this year I've had challenges with my vision, so I, the black is hard to see. I need good daylight. And everything else, you know, we need to see what we're doing. How long would it have taken you to make that basket that you're holding? This one? Well, I multitask. A lot of us. We basket makers multitask, we, you know. Um, I'd say I need a good week or two, because there's a lot of in-between time. And I very, I'm very particular about the covers. Is I, I think that's what makes the handbag. The cover has to sit on the basket. So there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of uh, skill that goes into that. Also these shapes, the elliptical is not that easy to do because you, you're really shaping it. And to lash the elliptical cover, it's really tough. I think it's almost as tough as doing the rectangle because you, you, your hands need to all manipulate everything. Well, it looks like it takes just as much time to think through it as it does to do it. I'm so glad you brought that up because as I said, this other handbag took me three years to figure out. Um, that's a lot of it too, is the creativity in your mind to visualize it. And to test probably, to do, you probably tested a couple of things to see if it worked? Yes. I imagine. Yes. I imagine. Well, you know, you sort of go and see how the weave is coming out. It's just like up different colors, different patterns, and then continue on. Dyes for the wolves, and um, it, it does. You, you're, you're constantly testing. Yes. Is that the color you wanted, or do you need it stronger? Or? Oh, I'm impressed that you used to dye because this matter business is oh, terrible. Yeah. And yeah. Children hated it. Right. <laughs> Did you try dyeing like the Irish wool? Yeah. Because that's that's actually using urine, uric acid. So mm -hmm. it makes me wonder why you're if your Irish wool um, smells a little, has a distinct smell, it's because it was sitting in uric acid. So, but thank you for asking that question, uh, saying that, because it's so true. I, I'm asked that all the time. And it's the thinking process that goes in, and the planning too, you know. Thank you so much, Thank you, and thank you for having me.